Hello everyone, my name is Brianna Curl. I will be your moderator for today's webinar, Steps to Get Your Controlled Impedance Right the First Time, a PCB Design and Manufacturing Expert Series, and it is hosted by EMA Design Automation and Sierra Circuits. EMA Design Automation is a leader in product development solutions, offering a complete range of electrical and mechanical CAD tools and much more. Sierra Circuits has 30 plus years of PCB manufacturing and assembly experience, which has made them the trusted source for end-to-end -end PCB prototypes. And I wanna thank you all for joining us for today's webinar and introduce you to our presenters, Amit Ball and Matthew Harms. Amit has been in the PCB industry for 20 years. He is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Sierra Circuits. Matthew Harms is an electrical engineer from Canada and has been with EMA as an application engineer since 2003. At EMA, he specializes in design set issues pertaining to part management, circuit simulation, signal integrity, and power integrity, but is conversant in all facets of ECAD design. Emmett will start off the webinar with the presentation followed by the demonstration given by Matthew. Assuming we have time at the end, we will field some questions in a formal Q&A. So thank you for your attention and now over to you, Emmett. Uh, thanks, Brianna. Uh, thank you, EMA, for hosting this. And thank you to all the attendees uh, for joining. Uh, controlled impedance is near and dear to my heart and every fabricator's heart. There are some uh, heartburns that happen and hopefully we can address those and uh, people can uh, have less of an issue with control impedance. So let's get started. So really it, control impedance starts always with material selection. Uh, so we're gonna cover that. We're gonna cover a little bit of stack up design. That's of course very important. And then, uh, Point C, which is you know how to really provide the complete information uh, to the fabricator, also very important. Uh, and then lastly, cross-section reports, uh, knowing that what you've specified uh, in your drawings and what you want from a fabricator, uh, knowing that that was actually met uh, in manufacturing. Uh, is the reason for cross-section reports. So very important. And then I'll hand it over to Brianna and Matthew to uh, talk more on the practical side uh, uh, in the design tools and some design tips for that. So it's gonna be an exciting webinar. So in regards to material selection, you know, Picking the right material for the right application is the way to go. And you know, the key thing here is that controlled impedance is not just governed by trace geometry. It's also governed a lot by the dielectrics chosen and the material properties. Uh, so that's a that's a key point. And uh, you can see some of the uh, speed. Uh, the uh, losses on the right of the materials that are most commonly used. But you know, keep in mind that you know, if the, the trace is controlled uh, by defining you know, the, the width and the thickness, and we'll cover that a little later, while the dielectric is defined by selecting the correct material with the appropriate dielectric constant, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and just as a quick pointer, if the dielectric height is reduced, uh, then your trace, that affects your trace geometry and your thickness of the trace would also need to be reduced, let's say if you want to maintain a 50 ohm uh, transmission line. So that's how they're related. So uh, when we're calculating controlled impedance and also in our free tool, um, we use Maxwell's equations for the PCB transmissions lines, and that renders a very accurate and suitable um, result for circuit board manufacturing. And again, controlled impedance, these models are all based on the dielectric constant, the dielectric thicknesses, uh, the trace geometries, both at the top and bottom of the trace, uh, and the resin content. So resin is, the resin content of the material is very important. Uh, sometimes it's not specified by customers and that's okay. Uh, you know, the fabricator 
should take that into consideration when selecting the materials to, to use. And so resin rich materials are really good for manufacturing. So the resin rich materials will flow into the peaks and valleys of the copper uh, during lamination process. Uh, resin rich materials are easier to laser drill uh, and plate for more reliable laser drills. Uh, and, you know, it is a judgment of the PCB manufacturer what, uh, what materials to use and what their resin content should be. But this also affects, um, you know, your DK. So Isola 370HR is probably the most common material. Uh, 408HR is also, um, you know, used widely in automotive and it's a good blend between reliability and electrical properties. Rogers 4350 uh, is very common material, Isola high speed. Uh, and, you know, the key thing is electrical properties aren't the only thing that's important, but also um, how do the materials manufacture? So that's a key point. Um, Panasonic has always made the Megatron series, which has been very, very popular, but now there's lots of materials that compete with Panasonic in those ranges um, and you know, are, are equivalent uh, in a lot of ways. So correlation uh, between resin content and DK. So the higher the resin content, the lower the DK value of the dielectric. And this is because the DK of the resin is lower than that of the glass weave. Um, you can also get uh, flat glass and it helps reduce the this knuckle effect that can be an issue. So I guess the takeaway is avoid prepregs with low resin content, um, partly because of uh, resin starvation and lamination and for the other reasons that I mentioned. And when the models are being created, uh, you know, try not to use so many different glass styles and prepreg types. Uh, because it can make the press out thickness prediction a little bit more difficult uh, and also uh, calculating uh, the proper DK becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, but our modeling does take care of that. Uh, it's not just for modeling, it's also for manufacturing. And so if you're using different types of prepregs, uh, the effective DK can be calculated using a weighted average method. Uh, in our article, however, we use a more sophisticated calculation using the Maxwell equations and where those uh, junctions appear. So trace width geometry as it uh, pertains to copper weights uh, is really important. So uh, I think this is common knowledge, uh, but it's worth mentioning that trace width and you know, thickness, of course, they impact the impedance, but they also are important considerations when a manufacturer is doing their etch comp. So if, for example, we need to reduce a trace within spacing, you know, that's always possible. But if we have to increase spacing, you know, or add a larger etch comp because of thicker copper, um, you, sometimes the designs don't allow it. So that would be a problem, you know, either the designer would have to figure out a different way to route and break out, um, or, you know, there's just gonna be a compromise in the final result. But uh, I guess the rule that, the takeaway rule here is know this uh, table, um, be aware of it, and uh, understand how the fabricator is going to manufacture your board. Uh, that might dictate that your your, your uh, design might dictate that we start with a quarter ounce foil, um, you know, because of the uh, accuracy and the tight spacing and the copper weights, you know, and that would ultimately affect the impedance results and even your initial modeling. So it's okay to talk to your fabricator and get an initial stack up, especially if you're, you know, really trying to be um, you know, keep your impedance uh, within a certain tolerance. So this is a stack up, a typical stack up. Um, this is for a 10 layer board. And uh, it's a lot of information, so I thought I'd go over some of it. So here, you know, when going it, going step by step, of course, there's the layer and then there's the 
you know, whether that layer belongs to a foil or is a part of a core. And most of the time, foils are on the outer layers, that's called the foil construction, and the cores are inside the board. A lot of people also put cores on their outer layers to control the dielectric thickness height uh, accurately. And that, of course, is completely okay. Uh, issues that can arise when you have outer layer cores is that you don't have the opportunity to as a manufacturer to register um, the outer layers as as nicely as you would if you uh, were doing a foil construction uh, just recognize that that can be a concern but in most cases it's okay uh, so and then the second thing is that you know the copper percentage plays a big role in press out so when we're doing a stack up design and when you're doing your modeling um, that uh, should play a role. What kind of copper percentages uh, do you have on your design? And, and that also um, is why most manufacturers will, will tell you something at the quote stage. And then when you send in your design, they make you modify things or tell you they want to modify things. It's because they have a more accurate model because they now have the complete design and they know the uh, exact uh, copper percentages per layer. And then also in this is, you know, what is the dielectric thicknesses and what are the foils that you start with and how much are you going to plate? And that's what I alluded to earlier that know from your manufacturer what are the plated layers. Um, if you have buildup, if you have sublams, you know, you need to know uh, what are the copper foils that are being started with and then what would the plating be? And then if there's like say a VN pad as well, you know, there's multiple plating steps. So, you know, what the target final finished plating uh, should be, uh, should and could be, should be really understood between you and the manufacturer as you're doing your modeling. So um, in providing uh, complete impedance requirements, um, you know, it's the material type, it's the copper weights, um, you know, if you have specific DFDK requirements, you can let the fabricator know and they would probably pick the material they're the most comfortable using. Uh, and that's also okay. Uh, and then, you know, you wanna specify exactly what layer you have your controlled impedance traces on. Uh, and you wanna specify your reference layers. All of that should be extremely well detailed in your uh, fabrication drawing. Now, in terms of controlled impedance tolerances, 10% is normal and five, and you can request 5% if you need it. I wouldn't ask for 5% if you don't need it because you're not sure if the fabricator is gonna give you within 10% or not. That just makes everything a whole lot difficult for everybody because if you say 5%, we're gonna aim for 5% and you know that's, um, we might require a first article uh, in the, on the manufacturing floor where we run the few panels through uh, lamination, you know, and measure the press out thicknesses and make sure that everything, you know, all the things that we plan for at the beginning actually turn out to be correct. Uh, and first articles, most of the time we charge that back to the customer. Um, so in my opinion you should only specify five percent impedance tolerance if you absolutely need it otherwise trust your fabricator to meet a ten percent uh, tolerance so this is some quick examples of how uh, you can put this on your fabrication drawing these are some notes uh, that you can reference um, you know one trick is that you want to make your impedance traces slightly different so it's easier to find in our cam step so if your trace width is supposed to be 4.75 um, if you make it four point let's say seven six or four point eight then it's easier to kind of like highlight all those uh, traces during uh, our edits so we're the cam operator is more aware so i like that trick and i think it makes everyone's life a little easier in terms of uh, cross-section reports, so there's two things. There's the impedance test coupons, and then there's the cross-section 
coupons. Uh, impedance test coupons are manufactured on the same panel um, with uh, the rest of the boards, and the, the coupon is modeled after your impedance requirements. So trace width, copper weights, et cetera, uh, dielectric heights. So the coupons are what is tested and not the bare board. If you do have a requirement that the actual board should be tested, you know, that's a special requirement. You'd have to ask the fabricator, you'd have to ask us, but we do have the equipment to do that uh, on the critical nets. Um, but normally it's just a basic TDR test. And you wanna make sure your TDR machine is calibrated often. Uh, and maybe even ask the fabricator the last date it was calibrated, um, even if you're not doing a full audit of the facility, just so you know that you know the information that you're getting is accurate uh, in terms of the impedance reports. Other customers I've seen put coupons per board. Uh, it does you eat up panel spacing, so it's gonna cost more, uh, but if the board is that critical, uh, then it might make sense to do that. Uh, cross-section, uh, we do in our uh, cross-section lab. So here's a quick uh, shot of that. And so a cross-section lab in a fabricator is for us especially, we rely heavily on the expertise and this, and this work because it tells us in process how we're doing and if something isn't correct, God forbid, if the press out wasn't what we expected, or uh, if there's not enough copper plating on the surface and in the hole, you know, any of those things, we'd like to catch it as early on as possible and not to fix it per se, but to not lose time uh, in our manufacturing process uh, and not cause any heartache to our customers. So we perform a extraordinary amount of in-process uh, checks. Uh, and that basically means you're punching out either a part of the board, the critical part of the board, sacrificing a board, or you're just punching out an in-process coupon. And you're measuring the dielectric heights, the press out thicknesses, you know, making sure there's good flow of the dielectric. Uh, and of course you're measuring the, if you've gone through copper plating, you know, the knee of the hole and if you're in a class 3a scenario uh, or space you're measuring uh you know the wicking and uh, the other additional requirements so in process cross-section reports are super important and then at the end if you're especially if you're ordering controlled impedance but it's a class two board you should still ask for you know your puck uh you should still ask for uh, just, you should definitely get your reports uh, to see that everything's kind of in line. And if you need help reading the report to understand what you're looking at, um, you know, please definitely get in touch with your fabricator. You can call us, of course, and we can explain everything that, you know, shows up on that cross-section report. Uh, very important. So here's uh, some quick measurements, uh, quick examples. Uh, where you can see, uh, you know, what kind of measurements you can get. Uh, looking at this, I think this is kind of like a probably hard gold surface finish. And so you have a little bit of a overhang here, um, which is to be expected within certain parameters. Um, and you can see the traces are trapezoidal. And you can, you know, make sure that how does this kind of equal the model that you started with and you know what kind of results are you getting? And control impedance is definitely an iterative process and you should rely on your fabricator to help you through that iteration and really be aligned, um, sharing your results with the fabricator uh, and having the fabricator share their results, maybe tweaking edge comp, uh, maybe tweaking uh, the materials uh, dielectric materials or glass styles that are used. Those are all things that happen, can happen regularly. It's up to you, the customer, to request that dialogue and uh, have that interaction uh, all to 
you know, get you the customer a better, a better product at the end of the day. Also in the slide deck uh, is some information for you to uh, look at on your own time, which is how to avoid some common mistakes in routing that basically that don't have to do with your characteristic impedance as much, but discontinuities uh, and how to reduce your discontinuities with your routing techniques. Uh, so those will be available in the slides. Thank you, Matt. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Matthew so he can take over and show us our demonstration. All right, thank you, Brianna. You can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna kind of show you the engineer side, what the engineer is, is doing to prepare to get the, to find out what the correct impedance should be. Um, to design for that impedance and how how to do that, to check for it, to route for it, and what the engineer is going to do on their side just to figure this all out in the first place. So I'm going to mention to you first off Sierra's tool that they have on their website. You can log in to their site and within their portal they have a number of designer tools here that are pretty neat. I'm going to focus on the impedance calculator, but just before I show that, I just wanted to touch on one other one. They have a trace width calculator, which I've had a number of customers ask for recently, so I thought I'd just mention that they have something like this. The question being, how wide does my trace need to be to carry a certain amount of current? And this tool will help you figure that out. Um, so great tool there that you can use for that, but we're going to focus on the impedance calculator tool that they offer. On this tool, you can take a look at a number of different scenarios and they have calculators that Amit was saying use Maxwell's equation are very accurate and are gonna give you a very good idea of what kind of a impedance you're gonna achieve with the stack up that you've chosen, the materials that you've chosen or vice versa. If you want to achieve a certain impedance, you can play around with the types of materials you need to use, the width and the thicknesses of the, the traces and the dielectrics that you're gonna have in your stack up to achieve that impedance. So a number of different calculators, I'm gonna go over two very simple ones, but I do wanna highlight that there are calculators for different dielectrics in the, in the same kind of area. Um, normally most calculators are just gonna do a single dielectric and you might average them or something, but in this tool you can actually specify two separate dielectric materials with different thicknesses and it'll calculate that. You can choose if your traces are coded or not coded, if they're embedded, so meaning there's dielectric above, or if they're strip line, which means there would be a conductor above and below that trace. And again, you can see from these pictures very quickly here that there's all kinds of dielectric scenarios that will work in this calculator. So some pretty neat stuff. I'm gonna go with coded microstrip for a single line. You can do coded for single, differential, and they also have all kinds of coplanar, uh, coplanar scenarios that you can run through as well. Coplanar being where you have some return path on the same layer as the signal that's traveling. Um, so some neat calculators that you could do with differential pairs with singles and uh, with even no ground underneath at all, which is a challenging scenario to figure out if you're ever in that situation. I'm gonna go with some of the simpler ones, uh, but again, note that there are some more complex ones that you can play around with. So first I'll do uh, single-ended with, uh, with coded microstrip. And what you're gonna do here is you're just gonna enter a bunch of information. And since this is not that exciting, I've entered it already beforehand and uh, specified my height and my dielectric constants. Notice that if you don't exactly know what ER1 means, you can see it over here in the graph and it's the dielectric constant of this material here between your plane and your trace. You can specify your width, you can specify your, uh, your delta W, which is gonna make for you the tapering that you see on this trace, which is something neat that this tool supports as well. So it does support modeling that tapered trace and the effect that that's gonna have by that trace being tapered as opposed to perfectly rectangular. You can specify your thickness, your coding heights. And at the end of this, it's gonna, you can hit the calculate button here. It's gonna tell you what your impedance is gonna be. So just for 
demonstration's sake, I'm going to change this to 5, and we should see the impedance here change down to 46 from 49 where it was. If we do want 50 ohms, we can enter 50 ohms here, and uh, then you can calculate what the other ones are as well. So uh, in my case, I'm going to go back here to 4.25. I'm going to calculate that, and that gives me that gives me a number quite close to uh, to the 49, or sorry, the 50 that I was looking for. So 49.622 is what I have here for an impedance. And maybe this is the stack up I'm going to go with, the width that I'm going to go with, and uh, I want to use that. You can also see some uh, some interesting numbers here telling you your uh, your propagation delay per inch, your inductance per inch, your capacitance per inch, and your effective dielectric constant as well. Uh, there's a bunch of material selections that you can do down here. So if you want to play around with some of the materials that Amit was talking about, you can check them out here and see what their resin contents are. You can see what the dielectric constants would be for those materials so that you can plug them into here. All right. Uh, this is the single-ended. You can also do, I have one here for differential as well, so you can play around with differential. You're going to be concerned with differential for your single-ended impedance, but also your differential impedance, and that's going to be largely controlled by your trace separation. So in this case, I have the the same stack up information as I did for the single. I brought it over here to the differential, and I want to figure out what my spacing needs to be to achieve 90 ohms. And so in my case, I, I played around for a little bit, found out that 7.75 would get me pretty close. And as Amit said, it might not be a bad idea for his sake to make it 7.77. If you want to be very specific, it helps them in their tooling to get that uh, a little bit more precise. So feel free to do that. That was an interesting tip that I thought he had. Okay, so this is one way of finding out what your stack up should look like, what materials you should use, what kind of widths, what kind of thicknesses, all that kind of detailed information. Great tool for finding out what some of that should be. And uh, a good thing to do before often you even get your board. And you can then take this data and plug it into the board tool, which is where I'm going to go now. In the board tool, in, in this stack up here, um, you can you can look at the material that we have here and just verify first off. So I'm going to open up my stack up tool, and you can verify in here first a few things. So within within our our PCB tool, you can put the same type of material in. I'm going to be focusing on the top and the power and this strip line layer right here. So those are the three layers. I have a few more layers going on in this board, but I'm really concerned with just those ones for right now, and uh, the thickness of these uh, of these materials are specified here, and those are going to match what I'd put into the Sierra calculator as well. And uh, what you can do over here on the right hand side is we do have a signal integrity area where you can look more into some similar information that Sierra was displaying as well. You can you can similarly to their tool, you can specify the impedance that you'd like to achieve. You can say I'd like to get 50 ohms. And it's going to automatically change the width here for you from, in my case, it was 4.25 to 4.17. And you can you can then manually change this to something else if you want to, and that's going to affect the impedance right away for you in this. Uh, you can also play around with your spacing. So if it's same layer spacing, so spacing between two nets on the same layer, you can specify that here, and that will affect, so let's say it's six, uh, that can affect your... Uh, differential impedance would then go down to 86. So you can play around with that and get the kind of play around with this and get the numbers that you'd like to achieve. If you say, you know what, I want a differential impedance of 90 ohms and I'm willing to change maybe not the line width because that's fixed to get my single single line impedance. I want to change my uh, spacing instead. So I'm willing to change my spacing. It'll go figure that out for you as well and tell you that your spacing should be 7.70. And again, you can round this if you want to, or you can make it a specific number, like uh, Amit had said before, but you can choose something that you and your, uh, and your fabricator are comfortable with. So in my case, I wanna focus on a couple numbers here, four numbers to be specific. On my top layer, my width needs to be 4.25 mils. 
to achieve my 50 ohm impedance. My spacing differential needs to be 7.75 to achieve both uh, the, the single end impedance and the differential of nearly 90. And then on the internal layers, I need four mils. So a little bit smaller than the 4.25 that I see there. And my spacing is gonna be six mils instead of 7.75. So we're gonna come back to those numbers periodically and just verify how to enter those numbers and how to check against them that we are meeting those requirements. Okay, so that's our stack up tool, how you can come up with uh, the stack up. You can discover what those widths and spacing should be, and then you're gonna need to next enter them. So uh, what we wanna do next after this is we wanna start entering some of those constraints in so that as a, as a designer, or if you're passing this off to someone else who's designing it for you, it, makes it somewhat foolproof. So once those constraints are entered, it really bounds the tool to do only things it's allowed to do. And that's what we're gonna do in our constraint manager tool. Okay, so in the constraint manager, what I wanna do is I wanna set up some rules. So I'm gonna set up a specific rule right here. I'm gonna call it diff pair underscore 90. And what that rule is, uh, if you remember the numbers that I was just talking about before, is on the top layer, I wanna have a trace with the 4.25 mils. On my internal layers, it's four, and then on my bottom, 4.25. We're really just concerned with these two right here at this time, 4.25 on the top, four in the internal. And we're also concerned with our spacing. So our spacing here on the top layer, we want our spacing between traces that are part of this group to be 7.75 mils apart. And on the internal layer, we want it to be six mils apart. So those were numbers that we derived from our analysis using either Sierra's tool or our own stack up tool here. And now we've entered them as rules. So the, the person designing the board is now gonna need to meet these rules and the tools will help them meet these rules so that your impedance is achieved that you wanna get. So that's how you enter the rule. You can then apply that rule to whatever nets you want. You can just choose a net and say, I want a rule on that, drop down the rule that you want or many nets. You can choose many nets at one time and apply that rule to them. Once that rule is applied, then all of these uh, all these fields here are populated with that rule. And if you ever decide to change the rule itself, that change will be propagated to every net that is assigned that rule. So it is very dynamic and you can see that in the tool right away. Okay, let's go now to a net that has that rule assigned, this guy right here. I I have not quite finished routing it. What we see here is a component on the top layer. So green is representing the top layer. Yellow is representing the internal layer that I have to work on. And what I wanna do is I wanna route this net and see how the tool is gonna help me do that. So I'm just gonna go into routing mode and select that rat's nest. And you can see right away it bounds those nets together because it knows it's a differential pair. I can double click to drop down if I wanna go down to an internal layer and uh, route this on internal layer, I can do that. And then it's gonna bring those nets off for me now on the internal layer. And it's pretty hard to see right here that the width and the spacing is different, but I'll go in once I've finished routing and just do some measurements and show you that that has been achieved, those requirements that we had. We can, we can finish off this routing. It's uh, relatively simple in this case. So I'll just uh, click to finish that and the tool is gonna take care of have everything else for me here. So routing that very, very simple. As a designer, I just, just click and, and route it exactly how I want to. What I wanna show you next is that the, that the requirements that I had were actually met. So you can see between here and here, we had a requirement that they needed to be six mils apart. And you can see that the air gap between those two nets is exactly six mils as I requested. And if you wanna check these ones over here, you can see that the separation between those two is 7.75. Again, as we requested in the constraint manager, we set that rule and the tool just takes care of it for us. So very easy to set those rules and then have the tool route to those and keep those. You can also kind of see the difference. I'll zoom in there pretty tight. And you can even see here that the width of this top layer here is a, a quarter mil is what this gap represents here, uh, a quarter mil wider overall 
than this internal one, which goes off to the left. So the top is quarter mil wider overall, and you can see that here in this little separation. So you can see that the width is itself taken into account and verified as well. You can, if you, if you want to, many of our customers do their impedance routing exactly like I just showed you right here. So you, you do some measurements, figure out what your, your spacing and your width needs to be, you can enter that in. You can also, if you choose to, go in here and create just impedance rules. So if you want to create an electrical rule for impedance, you can do that as well. You can say, I have a, a net, net class that's called diff. It has a 50 ohm impedance rule with 2% tolerance. And you can then go through and just assign that to different nets as well too. So you can assign that diff, diff impedance rule to these nets. And ultimately this is gonna do pretty much the same thing. Uh, you can do analysis on this as well and just verify. So when you analyze this, it's gonna tell you if you met this or not, and it's gonna show up as green or it'll show up as red if it doesn't need it. And it'll give you DRCs, which show up as little bow ties in your board. If you do have a problem, they'll also show up down here in your DRC window. So you can also use this impedance and specify it just as a number. And as it goes from layer to layer, it'll change the width automatically to achieve the impedance that you want. So that is certainly another option as well. Okay, uh, another way of checking this. So we have, we're gonna move on to checking. We have, we have a few ways of checking. I checked it manually using the measure, which you can do. Uh, another way of checking that is you can go to display the parasitics for this and you can take a look at this net and you can see a couple things about it. So you can see that the impedance for that is 50 ohms as we designed and the differential impedance for that is 90 ohms again as we designed. And you can see some other information here in this parasitic window. And again, on this one, you'll see the similar thing. So the impedance is correct as we designed and the differential is, in, is correct on both the top and the internal layers. So a number of, way of ways of checking. Uh, in honesty, my favorite checker is this one here that I'm gonna show you next. So you can go to uh, the workflow manager and in the workflow manager, you can do impedance analysis. In my case, I'm gonna select a number of nets. So I'll select these nets right here. And I actually have some nets that I wanna analyze up here as well too. So I'm gonna select these guys as well. And I'm gonna hit okay and I wanna start analysis. So I'm doing impedance analysis. I've selected the nets I wanna analyze. You could just as well do the whole board if you want to. And I'm gonna hit start analysis. This takes only a few seconds to run. So it's running analysis of the impedance of those traces, and it's gonna display it to us in what I consider to be a very, very interesting fashion. So it's gonna actually show it as an overlay that you can see right on top of the board to see exactly how you're doing. So that's finished now at this point, just takes a few seconds in this case to run. And I wanna view my impedance vision. So I'm gonna jump right to the visions here. And this might not show perfectly well, but you can see that everything here is dark blue. So the color is representing what the impedance of that net is. So you don't need to go probe everything, you can just see it at a glance. Uh, you can hover over this and see what that impedance is as well. The tech tip is going to show you what that is there. And this legend over here on the side is also going to show you. So you can see I'm getting very good impedance everywhere along this length. It's really rock solid. Let's move up here to these nets that I routed as well. And you can see, again, they're doing very well. The impedance is, is excellent for these nets with a small exception. So I am getting an exception here where in this range, I'm getting some red blips where my impedance is skyrocketing up to nearly 95. And the reason for that, this might be obvious to some of you, but some of you not. Uh, the reason for that is because I do have this plane layer here that has a gap in it. And that gap where I have two different, two different power levels on opposite sides of that, that gap is causing an impedance discontinuity in the nets adjacent to that power layer. So you do want to be very careful with your splits as they'll cause impedance issues like the one that we're seeing here. And if these traces were critical, you probably want to move that split somewhere else. Um, but what's really nice about this is that it's bringing something like this to your attention very easily. And things like this are very easily missed or just not quite paid enough attention to and they can cause issues later on. 
but with a tool like this, it's it's very easy to spot these these relatively common issues very easily. You can also view your differential impedance. So I'll just drop this down to differential. And you can see again, the colors are quite similar. So we're getting similar color all the way along. You can see as we kind of bump out here to match our phase between the two nets, you see that there's gonna be some differential discrepancies there. So we're gonna get a slightly different, different differential impedance at those points, which is to be expected. And as I come here as well, you're gonna get some changes. So as I pop to a different layer, you can see my differential impedance is going down to in the high 70s. And here it's up to the mid 90s. So we're getting some different differential impedances and you can from here gather if that's gonna be a large enough problem for you or if you're okay with it. These nuts I routed here are, are all together quite, quite well done and quite safe. So we weren't pushed too hard. We didn't have too many restrictions. So those are meeting our requirements there pretty clearly. So uh, that's everything I had to show you. Just kind of wanted to talk to you about how you can create impedance rules and how you can determine what they are in the physical world here, how you can apply those rules at the constraint level, and then how you can check against them in multiple multiple different ways of checking to ensure that you've met your impedances. So at this point, I'll pass it back to Brianna and then we have some Q&A. Thank you, Matthew. And with that, let's go into the Q&A. So our first question is, should the trace width for the same copper thickness lower in the inner layer traces than on the outer layer, assuming that the two traces are carrying the same current? Yeah. That was a lot of work. I didn't quite totally follow it. So should the trace width for the same copper thickness be smaller on the inner layer traces than on the outer layer, assuming that the trace traces are carrying the same current? Okay, so a couple of things I'll point out if I got the question right, I may have missed it and I may can correct anything I might get wrong, but current doesn't have a great bearing on impedance calculations. So it doesn't necessarily matter so much what current you're carrying. And I think the question was around, does the thickness always decrease when it's on an internal layer? And the answer is no, not necessarily. So it depends on the materials you're using, the stack up that you have, the thicknesses of those materials. So it might be smaller, it might not be. In my example here, it was a little bit smaller. The widths were a bit smaller and the separation was a little bit smaller to achieve the differential results, but that's not universal. It really does depend on the type of materials that you're selecting. And you can determine what those numbers are gonna end up being by using some of the calculators that we mentioned. So our next question is, could you elaborate how issues would be handled at the stage of the cross-section analysis? I believe this is for a minute. Yeah, so the cross-sections, the in-process cross-sections um, are partly really for the manufacturer to know um, if there's any, let's say, processes out of tolerance. So, you know, one example, uh, you know, when we do a lamination cycle, we include uh, couples like those temperature couplers. So we know that the material itself is heating at the right uh, slope, I should say, and the dwell time is correct. And then it cools down, you know, at the right uh, rate as well. So if, uh, if there's a problem in the cross-section lab, we will go back and see, uh, you know, let's say that the press out thickness didn't cut, you know, wasn't what we expected, or we see resin starvation, we would go back to our profile and see if that was done correctly um, as per the um, recipe, let's say. And, you know, if you're working with, um, you know, mixed materials, uh, this, this is an improvement cycle that is really just expected. So internal um, process inspection coupons are for uh, internal process improvements specifically to your design uh, as well. Uh, so if there's an issue, um, then, you know, at that point you really can't do anything to fix the design um, or sorry, fix the manufacturing. So it's really for internal purposes. 
Thank you. So our next question is, is thickness as defined in the materials table, the final pressed thickness? Uh, all material, all kind of all the things that you do in a PCB design should be final. Like your, what is your final whole whole wall that you want? The whole thickness. Um, you know, what is the finish thickness that you want of your PCB? What is the finish thickness between the layers? Yeah, it's pretty much. I can't think of a, an example where you don't want to mention the finished result. Everything is pretty much always the finished result. And if you have a special requirement where you're specifying, uh, I want to, I want you to, let's say, start with these materials regardless of anything, and this, and and they, the materials should be at this thickness. You know, you're kind of creeping into what a PCB manufacturer does, and you should really have a conversation with them uh, to make sure they don't misunderstand what you're asking for. Uh, but, you know, just to give an example, if there's a really critical impedance requirement or thickness requirement, we do mic the material as it comes in from the material vendors to make sure that, okay, this material is, this, this starting material thickness is exactly what we want to get the final finished thickness that we want. Yeah. And then Amit, another one for you, quick an answer, is the Sierra Circuit calculator free? Uh, it is free right now. I think that, um, you know, this is something that every engineer should take advantage of. Um, we're going to see what the, you know, what people give us feedback and how we can make improvements to it. And at some point it will not be free anymore. It'll be a nominal charge. Uh, but right now they, every, all the models are free. So this is for Matthew. During your demo, did you use the stack of viewer as a calculator or did the numbers entered in the stack of viewer affect the constraint manager and or design? Okay, so I did use it kind of as a calculator uh, in the sense that I put some numbers in and then I had the, the, um, the stack of editor calculate what my trace width should be similar to the Sierra tool and what my spacing should be, again, similar to the Sierra tool. So I did use the stack up tool as a calculator, and then I took those numbers from that stack up and applied them to a constraint manually. So I created a new constraint. I said, this is what I, this is what I want my, uh, my impedance to be, so therefore these are the thicknesses and the spacing that I want. Uh, our next question. Is it best to break up the length matching in the corners versus the end? I don't know the answer to that. Is it best to break up the length matching in the corners versus the end? Oh, I see. So I think I think what they're asking is when you want your phase to be the same, do you fix that at any point along the line or at the ends of the line? I think that's what's being asked. Is that some your understanding? Yeah, like when do you start doing the phase tuning? Yeah, okay, good question. So um, it depends how, how strict you are about your phase matching. You can do this both ways. So one way is just that you need the signals to arrive at the same time. You don't care really much about the phase as the, as the trace goes along. Uh, you just need it to arrive at the same time. So if that's the case, you can put that delay in anywhere you want. If you really do care that the that the traces are in sync throughout the duration of their length, then you do need to put those bubbles in all the time. So whenever you're making a corner, you need to put a little bubble in on each one so they stay in phase throughout the duration. And we have tools that help you route to those all the time. So we can certainly help with that. We have DRCs that check against that. So if you're out of phase by too much, it's gonna give you a DRC and you can go put your bubbles in to make sure you stay in phase throughout the duration. But it's up to you on how strict you want to be with that. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. Uh, why would you coat a micro strip? I'll answer it from a manufacturing perspective. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, you have to make sure that the material you're using has good adhesion. Um, so if you're using like a Rogers Teflon or something, uh, sometimes it can be very hard to, you know, Put any solder mask on that board um, and you know 
impedance, characteristic impedance does change after solder mask. Uh, so, you know, those are things that a fabricator needs to, you know, take into account and maybe discuss with you, um, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, I think it's a good question and probably I would like to um, defer to our electrical engineers on staff to give you a more thorough answer. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, how do you calculate impedance with hatched grounds or references? I'll take that one. So the the answer is not easily. Um, it's, it's challenging to do that with hatched grounds or, or references. Um, you would probably be moving into a signal integrity analysis tool where you actually have to route it and check it against that. So again, we do have tools that do this in our signal integrity space within the SIGRI tools. We have tools that can calculate the impedance of your traces with the hatch ground, but you're gonna need to, uh, to do a field solve on that and to get those results. I'm not aware and, uh, of a calculator that does this before, before it's routed, but one may exist, I'm just not aware of one. Uh, what value would you use for trape trapezoidal angles? I usually use either 80% or 70%. What is the most common value you see? Uh, yeah, so it really depends on your copper weight. I have to say it depends. Okay. Um, yeah, it depends on the copper weight. And you can ask your fabricator what they're expecting. But I think there is a general rule. Um, I'll get I'll get back to that person on the general rule. Um, and then there's also another question uh, about, you know, press out thickness. Is there some guideline to that? And I will also um, get back if there's kind of a general rule of thumb. Um, but I don't think on that one there would be because I think it really depends on the copper weights. Um, but I will get back to people on those kind of general rules of thumbs. Okay, thank you. Um, let's do this one. I think this one's for you, Matthew. Does a tool have capability to estimate reflections due to via stubs? Yeah, definitely. Good question. And uh, that's kind of the consequence of having some some impedances. If you want to kind of qualify a little bit more detail, well, what's the consequence of having some of these via stubs in this case, or in some cases, little bumps, uh, what effect is that ultimately gonna have? Is it serious or is it not? You do need to simulate that. So you certainly can. We have tools that can do simulation. You can include your via stubs, um, or you can say, well, what if I back drill them? What kind of effect does that have? And you can see the benefit of back drilling on some of those reflections. So yeah, you'll need to take it to the next step of analysis to get what some of those answers are, but you can definitely do it. Okay, thank you. And what level of PCB designer are you using? Yeah, so in my case for this demonstration, I was using PC, Allegro PCB designer. So um, there's there's two levels uh, underneath this, if I can use that word, but there's you can start out with the PCB standard and you can move up in functionality, get the professional. This is the one above that. This is PCB designer. The reason I picked this level of tool is because it has display parasitics. So the display parasitic I did need in the PCB designer. If you have the professional level tool, the ORCAD PCB Pro, you'll see, you'll get everything that I showed you with the exception of that display parasitic. Great, thank you. We had a couple questions on that. So that I think should cover most of those questions. Um, and then let's do one more here. Could you explain about the designing controlled impedance and vias? Well, I was going to say that uh, I know that uh, some of these topics are electrical engineering topics uh, and would benefit for from further exploration um, and are good webinar topics for the future. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I. We have a lot of questions I'm not able to get to and some other ones that um, will need some like electrical engineers perspective. So if we weren't able to give you a clear answer or able to get to your question, we'll follow you up with you all individually after the webinar. So um, if you have some burning questions, 
we'll get to you. <laughs> um, and with that, we are after two o'clock. So I want to thank you all for joining us and for participating. Um, we love doing these webinars with you guys. So with that, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Amit and Matthew, so much. Thank you, everybody.